Hi, everyone. I'm Vicki Volweiler from College Financial Prep. Excited to welcome my friend Hirsch Sermon to the podcast today. Welcome, Hirsch. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, Hirsch is from Lifecycle Financial, um, and he is a CPA and also a CDFA, which is a Certified Divorce Financial Analyst, but he works with everyone, not just divorce. So this is not a conversation totally specific to divorce today. Um, but we want to talk about, you know, obviously the financial, um, but, you know, a lot of people, they'll come to me, we'll talk about FAFSA, but we don't really get into the tax side and money that you can save and financial aid from the tax um, preparer side. So I figured we'd jump into a little bit and discuss that today, so, as well as, you know, all other financial topics related to uh, sending your kids to college. <laughs> so Sounds good. <laughs> So Hirsch, what's the biggest thing that you hear when you're talking to clients? Where are there opportunities to save that they may be losing out on? I, I just think in general, people need to plan when their kids are going to college. As you know, you know, they they do ahead of time, they fill out FAFSA, they fill out all the financial aid, they've maybe hopefully saved money. But when it comes to the tax side, it becomes April 1st or whatever it might be, and all of a sudden they're rushing to get it done. And they're not always thinking things through. There are some tax pitfalls. For example, there are families that do married filing separate when they file. And that not only people going through divorce, that's other people as well. And they need to understand that immediately helps them or, or works against them, I should say. They lose the lifetime learning credit or the American Opportunity Tax Credit, both related to college. And there are things like that and many others where they need to think it through ahead of time or plan ahead of time. Otherwise they do lose out in those kind of situations. Can I jump in with married filing separate? Please so do. I was just working with a client and everyone should be aware with this, a remarried client. So they were divorced. Now, now there's a remarriage. Um, and with FAFSA, even if there's a remarriage, you need to you need to submit the financial information, the tax returns for both parents in the household, even if one is a step parent. Yes, I understand that the step parent may not be contributing a dime, but those are the rules because everybody always asks me that. So if anybody's watching and thinking about remarriage, just understand, you know, you may want to delay it a little bit till after you're done with FAFSA. <laughs> but if not, and you're already remarried, yes, you're going to have to submit the, the new step parents information as well right yeah and don't not get married for that reason <laughs> but <laughs> but again it comes to the planning right i mean if you are thinking about getting married don't rush into it file your fafsa get married afterwards or something to that effect but i agree uh, it, it's part of the planning process if you're in that situation um so say somebody's married you know and they file jointly so th there's Again, you've got to look at each individual case. There are two main tax credits that somebody can get. The common one is that AOTC, the American Opportunity Tax Credit that I was speaking about. It's up to $2,500 per kid. Uh, depending on your situation, it is refundable if that situation happens, meaning uh, even if it brings you down to zero, you can still get some even uh, beyond uh, your tax liability, you can get a refund in that. There are income limits, so you do need to be aware of that. And that's part of the planning, again, that we've been speaking about. And that's the more common one. It's up to 2,500, as I said. The one that a lot of people are not always familiar with or not always even aware of is the lifetime learning credit. At that point, it has a maximum of $2,000. The nice thing about that one is sometimes people are not 100% sure what they want to do. And so if they're going to go to college and they're not declaring, like, I'm not in a degree program yet, I'm taking a little bit of coursework to really understand what maybe do I really want to do with my life, you can still take the lifetime learning credit in that situation, even though you're not in a, de a degree type program. Whereas with the AOTC, that American Opportunity, you have to be in a degree type program to be eligible for that. So again, understanding your situation, understanding the child, 
putting it all together, you really can lose a lot of money or you can maximize a lot of money depending on how you put your tax return together. So you're saying somebody can save up to 4,500. Correct. And then what would, what would 2,500, sorry, 2,500 in taxes per child for the AOTC. Right. But then can you add the lifetime learning credit to it? No, you take one or the other. The difference is the AOTC is four years and then you're done. The lifetime is forever. So you can take your four years. Let's say somebody does a five-year uh, time frame for a four-year degree. They take the four years of the AOTC, and then that fifth year, they're still eligible for the lifetime learning credit. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, so they, they shouldn't lose out on that. Or they go to grad school, right? Or in my case, for example, I'm a CPA. I've got to do 40 hours of continuing ed every year. If I do that to a specific, I mean, it's got to be an eligible coursework, but if I do it towards coursework that is directly related to improving my skill set, I can do the lifetime learning credit there as well. And that's a nice big advantage. And people really don't think about this beyond college. So can, pa can parent and child take the lifetime learning credit on the same tax return? You've got to pick who is going to take it. And quite honestly, what I always suggest there is, again, part of the planning who gets the bigger bang for the buck? And that often comes in where a parent or a joint return parents may, uh, they may earn out. So they earn too much money as an example. You know, as a married couple, generally it's about 180,000. If it's single, it's about 90,000 as the parent. So if I'm going to lose out on that credit because I can't do that, it may be, makes sense to have the child claim that and then you can still potentially take that but again it, it that's why i'm always saying it's it's a very specific family by family situation it really is yeah no i i totally understand that because you know even when i try to make generalizations when it comes to you know financial aid planning for college and fafsa and all that it's still every family has their own specifics yeah absolutely so something else that I was, Hirsch and I were chatting about this earlier, and I think it's important for everyone to realize that, you know, what may be best for planning for financial aid may not always be best for planning for your tax return. Correct. A hundred percent. So like fi for financial aid purposes, it may be better for parents to save money um, in the parent's name. But for tax purposes, right, that may be different. It, it, it may be. Again, you know, um, the classic is when they're looking at financial aid, they take a larger portion of the children's versus the, the parents' assets. And so really understanding that. Now, obviously, if you put it in a 529 plan, that is a different situation because technically it's, it's so to speak, in its own entity plan versus my savings or the child savings. So all of these kind of things need to be considered in saving towards college. And these are all very important pieces. Uh, and again, you can't do this in a week, especially in April of that year, because you know, you've know you got 40 other tax returns you're gonna get done that week as a CPA. You can't really spend the same time walking through and educating your clients. So this is something I always recommend for people when you start your FAFSA in the fall, start to think about having that conversation with your CPA. The money is here, the income is here, the whatever it might be to really get a situation specific to you, and then you can really plan it a lot better. And hopefully you've been doing this for years as you've been saving the money. Not everybody has, but the, the sooner you start, and that could be right now today, the better it is, honestly. Definitely. Yeah, so always lots of questions, you know, where to, where to hold money, where to shelter money. Um, you know, sometimes I'll tell people if if you can afford it, pay down your mortgage if you want, because, you know, it, it won't show up on FAFSA. But that right. also depends on the colleges that you're applying to, because some schools, if they require another financial aid application, the CSS profile, they are going to look at the value of your home. So, Correct. so sheltering the money won't really do anything there. Um, Correct. And, you know, the, the one thing I get asked a lot when it comes to saving for college, 
is, and I'll make up a scenario, right? My, my child's five years old. How do I know that they're going to even go to college, right? So number one is if you don't save the money, you're going to spend it. You're going to have nothing. That's number one. <laughs> number two is you still have access to that money. Should it be uh, that your child doesn't go to college, that's okay. You'll end up paying taxes on the growth of that money, but you've got the money in the account to pay the taxes. So it really isn't going to be a burden for you, but it will grow all of that time and you'll still have the money and you'll still have significantly more. In that case, they may be going to a trade school, whatever it is, you still got the money and many trade schools uh, right. Still well, you know, like that. Still the worst comes to the worst is you've got money sitting there for the last 13 years or whatever it might be and you've got money you never had and that could be a nice start to the, your child's life maybe you want to give it to them whatever it is you have options at that point significantly more than if you haven't been planning and you haven't been saving so even if it's a little bit at a time those 529 plans and planning ahead of time really is so so important I know in New York um, that there is also a penalty if you pull money out of the 529 plan. I'm not sure if that's true in every state. Not um, every, yeah, every state has its own tax rules. Every state is its own tax entity, just like Social Security is, like Medicare is, like the federal government is. And you do need to understand if you file multiple, sometimes people work in one state and they uh live in another one it's always good to check if you're in a multi-state situation as well so for um parents with high school seniors this year and everyone going to um college i guess uh, who will be a sophomore and up next year um you've already experienced the delays with fafsa but for um Certainly the, the rising seniors right now that are graduating spring 2025, um, we're going to be in a FAFSA delay situation again this year. Um, so FAFSA is scheduled to open December 1st, um, just so everyone is aware. CSS profile is still opening in October, so all is good there. Um, but but yeah, it may be a little bit of, uh, we may experience a little bit of craziness like we did last year with the delays, with the, um, the government sending the information to the colleges, the colleges being delayed with sending the financial aid packages to the students. You know, hopefully things this year will go smoother. So just wanted to share that with everyone. Yeah, and, and just a couple, my personal opinion here, um, you know, as you said, it's delayed. It's two at least two months delayed. Last time it was closer to three months. Right. Uh, which means there's less time, more people are going to apply in a shorter period of time. In my opinion, the earlier you get it in, and this is where I think Vicky can be so helpful, if you start planning now, the day that it opens, you can knock it out, the quicker it's going to get processed, the less chance there's going to be of an issue, because when the onslaught of these uh, applications come through, it really does take that much longer to get your responses. So I, I would suggest, you know, call Vicky, get it ready. You've got roughly what, six, eight, well, even more than that now, right? Uh, but be ready for that opening and, and try to get it done within the first couple of days. I think it would be so, so beneficial. So do me a favor for divorced families. Yes. Get, give us your guidance. So all, all your experience in working with divorce, um, I, I know we've shared some clients. Um, yes. yeah, <laughs> so, so tell us when they come to you and, and what they should be thinking about. So quite honestly, the best for me is when I can work with them even before they get divorced, especially because the verbiage in your marriage settlement agreement, that MSA, some places they call it a dissolution agreement, different names, different states. It's the same thing. That is your guiding principle of how it's going to get done. And I do find quite often, because I'm not knocking attorneys here, they're legal people, they're not tax people, they don't always understand how to put it into that marriage settlement agreement to be the most effective for them. You know, So sometimes it's a, a, almost like a punt to the other parent. If you can't get the tax credit, then X, Y, Z. There's so many other factors that do play in. 
And so I do think this becomes very, very important. We also have to think there are two families involved here, not one, you know. And so, because, and I say that because even though the parents have one, that, that one child, they often have, as you put it, blended into a new family. So often there, there's more than one entity involved in this when it comes to a family. So that's number one, is really you, you, you kind of need that language scrubbed a little bit by somebody who understands the, the implications towards college and beyond the other pieces from a financial and tax perspective as well. That's, that's number one. The other one is, and I know in certain situations, it's difficult for this, not everybody gets on with their ex-spouse, but sometimes we do need to try our best to put our personal pieces aside for the betterment of our kids and be able to try to plan together in that situation and being able to uh, really look at how is it gonna be best for us when it comes to filing and planning for college. And uh, on top of that, um, I I know how difficult it could be for you know those two parents to to get along and come to an agreement. Right. At, at the bare minimum, you know, you should always try to have your agreement say that you'll both participate in financial aid. Um, Correct. Because otherwise, the child is going to get nothing if the school requests both parents' information. Right. It's though things like that are very, very important. I, I always guide my clients don't overcommit when it comes to college. You know, taking our example of a five year old kid, you really don't know what your situation is going to be 13 years later. Right. So don't overcommit, even though you obviously want to. But it doesn't mean that if you have the resources, you can't contribute more than what you have committed. But you, you're 100 percent correct you really do need to know that because these things that you've just mentioned because the last thing that you want is your kid has this absolute dream school they want to go to and because one parent didn't submit a tax return or something simple like that they get denied that kind of an opportunity oh and the other thing that parents should know is that when students go to college freshman year they're only allowed to take out fifty five hundred dollars in student loans so many parents think, oh, well, we'll split it with them, you know, it, or, you know, in a case of divorce, oh, well, we'll do a third, a third, and a third. And it just doesn't work that way. Correct. Correct. <laughs> yeah. When you've got an $80,000 price tag on your tuition or more, or more uh, now. a third of that, you know, you know, roughly $27,000 for your kid and they've got a $5,500 uh, loan, they're not covering that third. You got to be very aware of those kind of things for sure. Definitely. I mean, sometimes, you know, the parents can co-sign a loan for the kids, but it's still the parents on the hook. Um, and, you know, and, and that brings up another thought um, that I think is important to put into your dissolution or your, your settlement agreement. A lot of parents, they'll just throw out something relatively vague. I believe you should build into the agreement a hierarchy of payments. And what I mean by that is scholarships should be the first thing that comes off the price tag you know the second thing might be your 529 plan that or you know maybe your uh your your loan for your kids and maybe if you but you want to get it down to a number and then split it as opposed to try to split it from the top and then throw whatever happens randomly into the mix so if you can think it through logically in that fashion and have a a hierarchy of what funds are going to be applied, I think it also makes it a fair bit easier for parents as well, ultimately. I like that. And, and the other tip, especially in divorce, actually, you know what, this is for all families, um, <laughs> is unless your child is going to go to that dream school and you know that you can afford that dream school, start speaking with your children early. You don't have to share your exact income and assets. But you should create a budget with your with your children and talk about like what your goals are for college and what um, you know what you consider affordable um, to try to minimize the amount of debt that you may, may need to take on. And it's okay to wait until spring to make that final decision after you see um, you know hopefully you see all the financial aid numbers. Right. right. No. Absolutely. I think building the right expectations 
well ahead of time, not in November for the following spring, but when they're a sophomore and they know that their next year being a junior is going to be a very important year, that's when their the children's mindset is very much in tune with that. So let's bring that message in, you know, and you can start that when they're end of their sophomore year, building those expectations. You're going to start taking the ACT, the SAT. You're going to start doing this. You're going to, whatever it might be, part of that conversation can be building the right message and expectations two or three years before they even go to school. Here, I'll tell you a funny story, true story. Um, so my daughter, who is first going into her sophomore year now, I mean, she hears me all the time. She she knows like the college business inside now, but she knows what her top school is. And it happens to be a local, you know, in-state school. Um, and she's like, well, if I get into that school, can I immediately say yes? Because she knows that I tell people to wait. I'm thinking that's going to be the lowest, you know, likely, yes, it's possible for a private school to be lower cost than a SUNY, but if that's your top choice school, say yes immediately. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's very <laughs> funny, actually. Right. But having the conversation with the kids, they get it. Right. Right. And and that's coming from knowledge as opposed to, you know, a pie in the sky wish list. Yes. hundred yes. percent. I think that's great. It will help them it help you ultimately save money on the cost of college too. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I, I think that that you know understanding, and unfortunately, you know, I mean, when my kids started college, which is already I don't know ten years ago, really. Um, I really didn't know any of this. We didn't know each other. I can ask you a question here or there. Um, and I didn't understand the difference between, you know, CSS versus this versus that and who takes both incomes, who doesn't take both incomes. And as a divorced family, as divorced parents, um, I don't know that we got the best. I mean, thank God it was a very good package, but I don't know that we got the best that we could have. And uh, I mean, I know I've sent parent, uh, you know, parents your way, both married and non-married. And they've definitely benefited by the education, the appeals. A lot of people don't even know you can appeal, uh, you know, when you get something. Uh, how do you play a school off against the other school? <laughs> you know, there, there's so many things that, that, that people just don't really know and understand. And that's why I think someone like yourself, the, the services and the knowledge is just so important for people. Oh, thank you. I usually talk about... Um... And this is a true story too. My my hot water heater broke on. It was January first, a couple of years ago. Um, sure. But I, but I had a couple of. I managed to get a couple of um, people in to give estimates, and one person had a higher estimate. One person had a lower estimate. They, I mean, there were some differences. Um, but I called the gentleman that had given the higher estimate back to thank him and say I was going with a different option. And the first thing he said to me was, can I give you a lower price? And the reason that I tell you that is because they're, they're a business and colleges are businesses. Yeah. So it's possible for everything to be negotiable. Uh, absolutely. And if they've accepted your kid, and again, sometimes they accept them pretty quickly, they want your kid there. You know, it's not like they were waitlisted and it was, you know, August 28th and they starting the first week in September, right? If they've uh, offered your, your kid a spot, they want your kid there. And so how can you maximize that? But what I will say about that, so everyone's aware, if we're talking about like a really selective school, an Ivy League school, True. a top school, they're not, you're not going to get merit aid there. Everybody is that bright. You're, you know, your child isn't going to get any merit aid. You will get close to, if not 100% need-based aid. So, you know, especially whether it's, whether it's a divorce, a job loss, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, hopefully never, or a parent, you know, unexpectedly passed or something. Right. Um, if there's a, a financial shift or financial concern um, and your child can qualify for the IVs, definitely that can help you save a lot of money. No, uh, yeah. And again, that's why you need the right expectations up front, right? Because you don't want to, go in with the wrong expectation, like with what you just said, and an Ivy League school may, or a very competitive school may be less flexible. You need to know that going in and understand that. Yeah, no, so it's, it's always the safe, I'll say the safety schools that where you're more likely to get a bigger right. package. 
Yeah. And, you know, there's some fantastic state schools. They don't always have to go to a private school. Uh, you know, things like that are things people need to consider because there is a significant difference. I mean, it sometimes people say, well, it's a $20,000 difference, which $20,000, a lot of money, but it's really not $20,000. Well, it's really close to 80000 or more because it's not a one-year degree, right? So <laughs> sometimes it helps in putting things into perspective when you look at it as how much is the degree going to cost me as opposed to what is it for one year? So that's that's how I look at things with clients. Um, not to say we don't look at how do I pay year by year because that's how you pay for college. Right. But when you make those decisions sometimes, I think you should be looking at a how much is that degree that four-year college going to cost as opposed to how much is next year going to cost or, you know, one year at a time? Definitely. Um, you know, when you're talking about out of state, so, you know, and then you also have to add in potentially all the airfare, the traveling back and forth and Correct. You know, all the other additional expenses that go with it. Yes, um, absolutely. You know, I know where I am. Sometimes people will, you know, Oh, my, my kid doesn't want to go to, you know, uh, a public state university. You know, everything is, uh, I'm sure it's the same where you are. Everybody wants what's not near them, you know, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, whether, you know, whether they're young teens and no, oh, there's nothing to do here. It's boring. Or, you know, whether it's going to college, it's always more glamorous to go someplace else. Um, it may still be the same education. You really have to think if it's worth right. the additional money. Well, I, I'm just thinking if uh, you're in New York, uh, you know, based out of New York, not you were nationwide, but I'm just saying you're based out of New York. Right. If they think in New York's boring, then no place has a chance. But <laughs> <laughs> um, No, but that's very true. I mean, you know, there's state schools that are not close or, you know, they're several hours away. It really doesn't matter. You know, I, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, they great state state, yeah, state schools three hour drive from where i am it really doesn't matter if you three hour drive or three hour flight you're still not in your backyard and at home and so really maybe that's part of the expectations when you're having those conversations yes you can go away to school but three hours is still going away you know yes yes <laughs> definitely um and for people who are you know, potentially separated or thinking about separating. Um, oftentimes, you know, we, we were discussing earlier about, you know, what to put into that agreement. Um, oftentimes, parents may put in up to an in-state university pricing, um, just right. just to have something in there to, to ensure that the parents are going to, you know, help with contribute. Yeah. And, and I will say this, some states require that actually there are some states that the statutes have that written in um so again really can't decide on a private school but correct correct and, and also obviously part of what i recommend and this is for anyone getting divorced not just college kids you want some language in there limiting the ability for the other spouse to commit you to spending money and what i mean by that is you, you know, in this situation of college, you can't have one parent say to the other, to the kid, go to that school, honey, it's great. It's a great school, you'll be happy there. And then they're expecting the other parent to pay half, right? I always have, when I make recommendations, I always have language that doesn't allow one parent to commit the other parent to more than like a hundred dollars, let alone college tuition. But those are the kind of things to safeguard and protect yourself when you're going through a divorce, which is a very important thing as you're going through to be able to protect yourself. Because sometimes we don't know what's going to come up five years and 10 years down the road, and we need to be able to protect ourselves. Yeah, no matter what it is, whether it's, you know, whether it's college, whether it's music lessons, whether it's, you know, um, right. Joining the hockey team, you know, if, if you, you can't always force the other person, you know, if it's something that you want for your child, you know, sometimes you just have to be prepared to do it on your own. Right. And, and that right. be true with, pri you know, a private university. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Uh, well, I want to thank you so much, Harsh, for being here today. Um, do me a favor. Tell everyone where they can find you. Well, firstly, I, this was this was a great conversation. I think we, we covered so much in a real short time, so I, I'm glad it, it was great. Uh, the easiest way to get in touch with me is just to go to my website, and you can send me an email through the website, lifecycle.financial. That's lifecycle.financial. Fabulous. Thanks, Harsh. Or you can always reach out to me at collegefinancialprep.com and I can introduce you to her. Either way. Um, Either way. <laughs> want to thank everyone for joining us today on this episode from College Financial Prep, Preparing for College. Thanks, everyone. Bye.